<clears throat> Zalim. Hi, my name is Chris, and I am the moderator for tonight's Telephone Town Hall. We'll be discussing the facts behind Measure 2 on your ballot this November. If you have a question at any time during this event, all you have to do is press zero. It's just like raising your hand in a classroom. That way we can take your questions live and have a discussion. We're joined by two great speakers tonight. The first is Dana Bieber, who is a spokesperson for the Vote No on Measure 92 committee. And the second is Kevin Richards. Kevin is a carrot seed and alfalfa farmer from Madras, and he's joined us to talk about how Measure 92 is harmful to farmers. He's also a member of the Oregon Farm Bureau and the State Young Farmer and Ranchers Committee. And again, for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Chris, and I'm the moderator for tonight's discussion about Measure 92, which is on your ballot this November. If you have a question at any time tonight, please push zero on your phone to ask that question. Dana? Thank you everyone for joining us for tonight's discussion on uh, Measure 92. I'd like to take just a moment, if I could, and give you an overview of the measure. Um, you know, Measure 92 is uh, a, about a misleading, poorly written labeling scheme only for the state of Oregon. In fact, it's so poorly written that it won't tell consumers about which ingredients are in their food. At the same time, it actually conflicts with the national labeling system, which again provides inaccurate information for consumers. And for all of this, at the same time, it will increase the cost of food for Oregon consumers and it will increase costs for Oregon taxpayers. That's why the No on 92 Coalition has come together to urge an, a no vote. Um, but you know there's another group that's really hurt by Measure 92, and that is farmers. And I'll turn it over to Kevin to explain more about that briefly. Yeah, thanks, Dana and Chris. I, I'm really pleased to join you all tonight and talk about a farmer's perspective on Measure 92 and um, how... Uh, really, it has a pretty dramatic uh, potential to, to harm and impact agriculture and family farming in Oregon. Uh, first, by just changing production practices and, and adding uh, costly and unnecessary stewardship requirements for the way uh, farmers uh, go about their business in our state. And then adding, uh, you know, the risk of lawsuits uh, uh, to, enforce the, uh, to enforce Measure 92 and, and enforce the labeling requirements. And then uh, let's not forget that uh, Measure 92 is a labeling requirement that would apply only in Oregon, and that means that all the costs fall uh, just on Oregon farmers, making it harder uh, for us to compete uh, outside the state. And, and lastly, I think the biggest thing that uh, farmers should um, worry about is how Measure 92 would really drive innovation out of our state and make it more difficult uh, for, uh, for agriculture and for family farms to benefit from uh, cutting te cutting edge technology. Thanks, Kevin. And again, for those of you who are that are just joining us tonight, my name is Chris. I'm the moderator for tonight's telephone town hall about Measure 92. If you have a question at any point that you'd like to ask us, press zero on your phone because we would love to hear from you. But before we hear the first question from someone out there in Oregon, I, I actually want to ask a question of you. Using your phone keypad, Tell me about what actions you're willing to take to protect Oregon farmers. Push one on your phone now if you're willing to encourage friends and family to vote no on Measure 92. Push two if you're willing to write a letter to the editor about voting no on Measure 92. Push three if you're willing to share information on Facebook or Twitter about voting no on 92. And push four if you're willing to do all of the above. Again, that's one, to encourage friends and family to vote no on Measure 92. Two, to write a letter to the editor about voting no on Measure 92. Three, to share information on Facebook or Twitter. Or four, to do all of the above. And again, for those of you who just joined us, if you'd like to ask a question at any time, press zero on your phone now. And the first question I have, actually, is one for Dana. And what I want to know is a lot of people have been asking us, how does Measure 92 increase costs for Oregon families? 
You know, this is one of the questions that I think is perhaps most important for consumers and for voters to know about. You know, Measure 92 is an Oregon-only uh, measuring, or excuse me, labeling requirement. And what it would require is for food companies, well, they would have to remake their food just for the state of Oregon in order to avoid having to put an inaccurate and misleading label on it as required by Measure 92. So what this means is they would have to remake their food just for this state, and that's where the higher costs come in. You know, if you think about it in a practical standpoint, the box of cereal that's sold in Washington cannot be the same box of cereal that's going to be sold here in Oregon. That increased the cost for Oregon consumers and Oregon farmers. Studies have been done on this, and it, um, they estimate that it will increase the cost of groceries for the average family by at least $400 a year. So that's where the real costs come in for consumers. There's also going to be a cost for taxpayers as well because there's two new state bureaucracies that will have to regulate and enforce Measure 92, um, and there is no spending uh, limit of what can be spent of taxpayers' dollars, nor is there actually a funding source, so it just comes out of the general fund. So it's costly for consumers and for taxpayers. Thanks so much, Dana. Again, if you want to ask us a question, all you have to do is press zero on your phone. And we're going to take our first question tonight from Rose in uh, Beaverton. Rose, it looks like you have a question about uh, where this law affects people. Yes. Yes, I'm interested. Is it just Oregon or is it other states? You know, Rose, that's one of the reasons it's such a troubling measure and it deserves a no vote. This is an Oregon-only proposal. So it's a labeling system that doesn't exist in any other state in the United States, and so it's just Oregon. So Oregon food producers and Oregon farmers will have to comply with this, and that's why it's so cumbersome, and that's where the real costs come from. And again, for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Chris. I'm the moderator for tonight's uh, Measure 92 Telephone Town Hall. Uh, I'm joined by Dana Bieber and uh, by Kevin. And actually, I have a question that I want to ask Kevin. Um, does, does Will Measure 92 limit you know, the opportunities for farmers here to take advantage of future crop advancements? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that's a great question, first of all. Um, I think that a, the most obvious thing is the direct cost of um, of Measure 92 in terms of uh, production practices and stewardship, uh, but probably the even greater cost is the opportunity cost uh, down the road of uh, future innovation and the opportunity to take advantage of uh, the latest technology, the, uh, the best uh, crops and best uh, varieties of crops in our state. So that could be anything ranging from uh, new uh, drought tolerant and, and uh, water uh, use efficient uh, crops. It could be disease and pest resistant varieties in different crops, and it could be even things with health and nutritional benefits for consumers. Um, there's a lot of that technology that I think is, has the potential to, uh, on one hand, benefit uh, consumers, but it's also a, a value uh, proposition. It's an opportunity for farmers as well, and Measure 92 would uh, drive out that innovation and make it harder to introduce that technology in the state. Thanks, Kevin. And again, we want to hear from you. So if you have a question, press zero. And we want to hear about what actions you're willing to take to help protect Oregon farmers. So if you're willing to encourage your friends and family to vote no on Measure 92, push one on your phone. If you're willing to write a letter to the editor about voting no on Measure 92, push two. If you're willing to share information on Facebook or Twitter, push three. If you're willing to do all of the above, push four. And our next question comes from Barbara in Troutdale. Barbara, are you there? Yes, I am. Go, yes. go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, okay, how is this supposed to help farmers? Kevin, do you want to take that one? Sure. Well, Measure 92 um, certainly doesn't help farmers. Um, Measure 92 is, it will create really burdensome, uh, burdensome requirements that farmers will have to uh, follow uh, to um, segregate their crops, uh, be it uh, using different equipment, cleaning equipment, uh, using more uh, costly and labor-intensive uh, production practices, maybe taking certain land out of production or diverting to different crops by using buffer strips uh, to, to ensure that you're able to meet the labeling requirement. Um, and then uh, all of the uh, downstream effects in terms of lawsuits and uh, the difficulty uh, competing uh, with farmers outside of Oregon and, and like we already mentioned, the, the uh, difficulty of uh, having access to the latest technology in agriculture in our state. So certainly Measure 92 uh, 
isn't going to help farmers. It's going to hurt them in a in a huge number of ways, and that's why we're really urging uh, folks to vote no on 92. Thanks, Kevin. Again, for those of you who have just joined us, all you have to do to ask a question tonight is press zero on your phone. Uh, we're going to take a question from Jack. Jack has a question just in general about the concerns about GMOs. Go ahead, Jack. Where do you buy grain? Where do you buy seed seed grain that that has not been genetically meta modified? I mean, every every all the soybean you can't buy old fashioned soybean seed. You can't buy uh, hybrid seed for corn. They all of the all of the wheat has been modified. I mean, why why the why the big rumpus now? I mean. No, Jack, you, um, it, it's a great question. Uh, Measure 92 has uh, the potential to dramatically um, change the way, the landscape of agriculture uh, in our state. And, and as you raised, um, it, it really is in conflict with modern production practices um, and, and really uh, makes it more difficult for farmers to uh, use the latest technology, use the best seeds uh, that are available, uh, and, and adds layers on. Uh, costly and, and unnecessary requirements. Thanks, Kevin. Again, press zero if you want to ask a question. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Dolores here in Portland. Dolores, go ahead. I wonder who's behind the measure and what are, what are they gaining from it? Oh, Dolores, that's a very good question. You know, let's go back and give a little history on Measure 92 and where it started. You know, it actually, this kind of single state labeling initiative started in Oregon. Oregon voters rightly rejected it a few years back. Then, uh, then it was recycled and took to California voters. They rejected it. Then it went up to Oregon, or excuse me, up to Washington. Washington voters rejected it. And here we are right back in uh, Oregon with the same flawed labeling um, measure. So it's been an out-of-state effort for all these years, and it's, and it's really been a group of folks who, for some reason, they really are, are intent on, on hurting the farmers and food producers of that state because they want to put an inaccurate and misleading label on the food products that are sold in that state. You know, one thing that's important to note is that we already have two national labeling standards that provide information to consumers as to whether there's GMO ingredients in their food or not. So consumers look, can look for the organic or the non-GMO label. Both of those are reliable and accurate. They're already in place, and they don't have all the uh, exemptions of Measure 92. That's why it's one of the many reasons this, uh, this measure deserves a no vote. Great. Thanks, Dana. Again, if you want to ask a question, all you have to do is press zero. Um, our next question comes from uh, Mary in Aloha. Mary has a question about other states and their labeling laws and Yes. Do other states have a similar maize uh, labeling law? And if so, how did they, how does how they have it enforced different from what this one wants to enforce? And what differences did they have to deal with? Mary, terrific question. Uh, you know, actually, there is only one other state, and that's the state of Vermont, which, as we all know, is not a farming state unlike Oregon. Vermont is the only other state that has passed a, uh, a law that is uh, going into effect uh, in 2016. So really, the and you know what? Measure 92 conflicts with the Vermont law. So already there's only one state that has this law and one other state here, Oregon, that's taken a look at this. Those two measures already conflict. So you can see with this state-by-state -state approach where you could set up this patchwork quilt where we could conceivably have 50 different states with 50 different labeling standards. Now, how are farmers supposed to farm their product? How are food producers supposed to produce their product for a multitude of states? It creates this patchwork system. That's why farming, or excuse me, labeling systems should be set at the federal level because every farmer, food producer, and consumer should be treated equally. And that's why the national labeling standards that we have, the two of them for GMO foods, are those are the reliable and accurate systems that work. Again, if you want to ask a question, all you have to do is push zero on your phone. And if you want to get more information about Measure 92, go to factsabout92.com. We're going to go to Reba in Hillsborough with our next question. Reba, go ahead. If this measure is passed, won't that cost more for the consumer in the grocery store and practically every place else? Uh, prices are already too high, so I don't think we need this measure. 
Boy, you're right about that, Reba. Prices, of course, will go up because, you know, it's a single state. You know, Oregon's got this go-it-alone attitude on this measure, and this is what it would create, that food producers – and here's how the cost goes up. Food producers would have to remake their food just for the state of Oregon in order to avoid having to put this inaccurate and misleading label on it. That increases the cost of groceries. And there's been studies that have been done on these single-state labeling uh, measures, and it estimates that the average family would pay at least – $450 $450 more for the cost of groceries. And it makes sense, you know, if you think about it. If food producers have to produce certain foods for Oregon, and then they have that's their certain Oregon labeling requirements, but then the same foods cannot be sold in Washington and Idaho, that's where the cost comes up. If you want to ask a question tonight, again, all you have to do is press zero on your phone, just like raising your hand in a classroom. Our next question comes from Chantal in Portland. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I actually work in the food manufacturing industry, and I could envision that food manufacturers just will not produce food for Oregon. But what I'm curious as a consumer, what will I see on a label that is different than what I see right now today? What information am I going to receive? Well, if you hear the proponents talk about it, they'll tell you that you'll find out the information about which foods contain GMO ingredients and which don't. Well, that's actually not true. That's, in fact, where the measure fails on its fundamental promise. And that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, Measure 92, it contains all these indefensible exemptions and loopholes that simply don't make any sense, and they end up providing misleading information. And I'll give you a few examples, Chantel, of what I mean by that. You know, the proponents started with a blank sheet of paper when they wrote this measure. And the very first thing they did is exempt two-thirds of the food and beverage that's sold in the state of Oregon. So already we only have one-third of the food that's even covered. But then there's other exemptions. So there's foods that actually do contain or are made with GMO ingredients, but they get a special exemption. For example, foods such as meat and dairy products that come from animals that were fed GE grains and injected with GE medications, well, they get a special exemption so they wouldn't be labeled. So we're already ending up with misleading and inaccurate labels on the foods uh, that we would buy under Measure 92. And that's one of the many reasons it's a flawed proposal and it deserves a no vote. And again, we want to hear from you. So if you have a question, all you have to do is push zero on your phone to ask that question. But I have a question I want to ask you. What worries you most about Measure 92? Uh, Push one on your phone now if it's the impact that this would have on local farmers. Push two if it's the increase in grocery costs. Push push three if it's the misleading labels. Push four if it's all the above. Again, push one for the impact on local farmers. Two for the increase in grocery costs three for misleading labels, four for all of the above. Uh, we have a question now from Donovan. Uh, Donovan, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I was just curious as to who is making this measure again, because as I've heard from everybody, it's only going to negatively affect our community, so I don't understand why it's being brought up again. You know, you're right, Donovan. It's going to negatively affect the farming industry here in the state of Oregon, which is a big economic driver for the state. It's going to increase the cost of groceries for families. Taxpayers have got to pay for it, and we get a misleading and inaccurate label. And, you know, Donovan, you mentioned something about, you know, why are we doing this? You know, Oregon voters rejected this measure a few years back. It's really where it started in Oregon. Oregon voters said no. So a group of folks, uh, out-of-state folks, took the measure to California. California voters rejected it, then Washington voters rejected it, and now it's back in Oregon. It's the same flawed measure. It is poorly written, and it's costly, and it deserves a no vote. Thanks. Our next question comes from Chuck in Eugene. Uh, Chuck had a question about something he saw on the TV. Go ahead, Chuck. Well, I just wanted to point out that uh, this evening, on the evening news, uh, a very well-dressed, smiling gentleman a proponent for Measure 92, uh, made the comment that caught my ear. He said it would not increase the cost for the farming community. Uh, Would you care to respond to that? It sounds pretty patently false to me. Yeah, Chuck, I I think it's it's an outrageous claim, to be frank. It it absolutely will increase cost to farming um, foremost. Uh, just changing the the way we go about our business, the production practices that we follow, in order to comply with Measure 92. Uh, if they're if you're growing uh, GMOs on your farm, uh, it'd be necessary to keep them entirely segregated. So that could require um, 
uh, purchasing a whole new fleet of equipment, or it could it require, you know, costly labor-intensive uh, practices during the busiest time of the, year, of the year when you're planning and harvesting to make sure that uh, you don't uh, unintentionally um, get any GMOs and non-GMO and, and so on. And it could even uh, require, depending on the crop, that you have, uh, you know, large uh, spatial segregation, so buffer strips uh, between different fields. Um, it could completely uh, change your crop rotation so that you are, are uh, choosing uh, what to plant uh, and where to plant it in a less efficient, uh, less profitable way. Um, so those are all direct costs, not even to mention the record keeping and, and the testing and the compliance that's necessary uh, to be um, to follow the labeling requirements. Um, and then uh, as a farmer, I worry a lot about uh, regulation. I worry a lot about the risk of uh, lawsuits. And, and that's uh, a huge, could have a huge impact, uh, not just on me, but on uh, uh, downstream where I sell my product and uh, the marketability of my crops. So uh, I think that it's, it's outrageous to think that Measure 92 wouldn't cost farmers, and I think that's the most important reason to, uh, to vote no on 92. Thanks, Kevin. Again, if you want to learn more about this, you can go to factsabout92.com. If you have a question you want to ask us tonight, all you have to do is press zero on your phone. And we're going to take our next question from uh, Nancy in Portland. Uh, Nancy, go ahead. It looks like you had a question about uh, big food companies leaving the state. What will happen if 92 passes? Will the big companies, say the big cereal companies, for instance, even send food to Oregon? Nancy, that's a good question. It's about the choices and what is it going to mean for Oregon consumers. You know, I think Measure 92 is actually going to reduce consumer choices. You know, I, no, I'm not so certain that the big food companies are going to pull out of the state. I, I, I think we're still going to see those food products here. Um, they will be higher priced most likely because they'll have to be made with non-GMO ingredients in order uh, to avoid having to put that label on it. So the cost will go up. But, you know, it's not the big food companies. It's the smaller food processors that I think will have a harder time. You know, they would have to remake their product just for the state of Oregon. That's an enormous cost for smaller food producers. And so considering that Oregon is only less than 1% of the national food market, it's conceivable that there are food companies that say, you know what, it's just too expensive. The barriers are far too high to sell in the state of Oregon. And that's where Oregon consumers would miss out on smaller food uh, production products, and that's where the cost goes up and the choice goes down. It's one of the reasons that Measure 92 fails consumers, and frankly, it just deserves a no vote. Yeah, Dana, I think that's a great point. And, uh, you know, for farmers especially, it's uh, Oregon has a tradition of uh, being innovative and having small uh, niche uh, farmers that uh, seek out, uh, you know, value-added markets for their products. And I think it's those small family farmers, um, uh, particularly those that are, are trying to uh, retail direct to consumers who are going to be impacted uh, the most. They operate on small margins and uh, it's really going to make it hard for them to do business and as a result reduce a lot of choice for consumers in Oregon. Great. And our next question comes from Clark. Clark, go ahead and ask your question. Um, yes. My question is on what is the science on GMO, um, say USDA, <clears throat> excuse me, about how that impacts or whether it's good or bad? I'm curious on that. Hey, Clark, this is Dan. I'm happy to answer this question. I know Kevin will have a few comments as well. He, he knows all about this. Um, you know, the GMO foods, they have been on our uh, kitchen tables for over 20 years now. We've been eating these foods. Uh, they are the most tested food crop in the entire uh, food chain. And, in fact, they've been studied by organizations like the American Medical Association, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, the World Health Organization. And, in fact, there's been... 1,700 studies, um, over 1,700 studies that have been done on GMO foods, and they all reach the same conclusion. Not only are the foods safe, of course, but they are identical to non-GMO foods. Yeah, Again, and, uh, Dana, before, um, you know, before a product, you mentioned that it's the most heavily tested and, and regulated product and really food product in history in, in the U.S. before GMOs are even introduced uh, to be grown commercially. Um, they have to go through a very rigorous uh, regulatory process and ha have to be determined that they uh, pose no risk for, for human or environmental safety. So uh, certainly the, the, the science is there and, and the, 
the risk is uh, non-existent. And for farmers like me, it, uh, GMOs are uh, really helping us do what we do better, uh, grow more uh, crops more productively, more efficiently, uh, with fewer resources. Thanks, Kevin. Again, for more information, you can go to factsabout92.com. And if you want to ask us a question, you can go ahead and push zero on your phone. Uh, we've got a question from Bill in Beaverton who keeps hearing kind of different information about what is or isn't on the labels. And so, Bill, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Well, my question is in regards to, um, like, GMOs and everything. I was just doing a little research and whatnot on what the actual GMOs is, is genetically modified organisms are plants or animals that have been genetically engineered with DNA back from bacteria, viruses, or other plants and animals. But what I want to know is on the actual labels, they say that it's, I keep hearing that it's false and that it's, the information on there, excuse me, will be false and inaccurate. And how will that be false and inaccurate? You know, here's that's a good question. You know, here's how it's false and inaccurate: is the label. Would, there are some products that actually contain no GMO ingredients in them. An example of that would be uh, products such as sugar or cornstarch or soybean oil. So these products, and they're of course in, in lots of different food products. These products, once they're processed, they actually don't contain any GMO ingredients in them at all. But yet they would have to have a label on them saying that they do. That's misleading and inaccurate. At the same time, the way Measure 92 is written with all these special exemptions and loopholes, there are thousands of food products that actually do contain or were made with GMO ingredients, but they get a special exemption. You know, for example, uh, meat and all dairy products that come from animals that were fed GE grains and injected with GE medications, well, they get a special exemption and they wouldn't be labeled. That's where it's misleading, and beyond that, it actually provides inaccurate information to consumers. It's why, one of the many reasons the measure deserves a no vote. Yeah, and Bill, you, you mentioned um, the process that's used um, to genetically engineer crops, and I think that's a really important distinction, um, that, that GMOs uh, and genetically en genetic engineering is, is a process, and for labeling, what we care about are the characteristics of the crop and uh, the characteristics of the food product. And that's why FDA uh, and uh, every health and, and uh, um, safety uh, organization uh, virtually around the world has, uh, you know, decided that it's not necessary uh, to label GMOs because the characteristics uh, are the same. Uh, GMOs, conventional crops, um, they don't pose uh, any different um, safety or, or health risks um, for consumers whatsoever. Again, if you have a question you want to ask us, go ahead and push zero on your phone. Our next question comes from uh, Dennis in Beaverton. Dennis, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, uh, I'm just wondering, who's pushing all the anti-GMO stuff? I just hear it all the time everywhere. Uh, you know, Dennis, you're going to find this, and as you probably remember, this was a uh, nearly identical issue that was before Oregon voters a few years ago, and Oregon voters rightly rejected it then. And so there was the, this group that then took it to California. They rejected it. Washington rejected it, and, and it's right back here in Oregon for yet another vote on the same poorly written initiative. And it's it's a group of it's an outside um, uh, outside of the state group that has come together, and and for whatever reason, they have continued to advance these poorly written measures that really harm farmers, because that's really where it's at. It puts the greatest burden on Oregon family farmers. Yeah, Carl, and I, I think it's just, uh, it's really unfortunate um, that in part it's a, uh, it's animosity towards uh, innovation and technology in agriculture, and I think it's in part folks uh, aren't very well informed, and that's why it's so important uh, that Oregon voters uh, definitively vote down uh, 92 um, and show our support for family farmers and for um, for uh, technology and agriculture. Again, if you want to ask us a question, all you have to do is push zero on your phone. To learn more, you can go to factsabout92.com. Our next question, is, question comes from Roger. Roger, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yeah, would that be, I didn't hear my name, but would that be for Roger? Yep, that's for you, Roger. Go right ahead. Okay, I'm in Gresham, Oregon here. And I've heard you talking from the beginning, but uh, <clears throat> research and so-called GMOs, especially with uh, 
grains and wheat and uh, the things that the world eats and needs. We've been the breadbasket of the world because of our research and such. I'm not sure that uh, we need uh, either this measure for Oregon, because yes, it's poorly and and uh, it's a poor measure for anyone, but I'm not sure we need any additional labeling as you stated. At no, you're, the very you're exactly right, Roger. Uh, we have a, a very robust uh, federal regulatory process, both for the introduction of crops uh, but also to, to review uh, whether or not it's necessary to label a food product. And that's where uh, we should be uh, discussing this issue at the federal level. It's the, it's the responsibility uh, of FDA to do that. Uh, we don't want a fragmented system uh, where we have 50 different states with 50 different um, labeling requirements that makes it harder for farmers to do their business and harder for us to not just market our products uh, locally but in other states and and around the world. You know, we, we agree with you, Roger, and, and it's one of the many reasons that people should vote no on Measure 92 in no, this November. Our next question comes from Claude. Claude, are you there? Good evening. Uh, I have a question concerning GMO modification and hybrid seeds. If, uh, if GMO modification has been used to produce hybrid seeds and we have to go away from that, that would be, that would be disastrous. Uh, I was born and raised on a farm back in Iowa, 1930s and 1940s, and I know that we were fortunate those years to get 35 bushel an acre on corn, and now they're getting 150 bushel an acre, and a lot of that is due to hybridization. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the, the advances that we've seen in uh, all kinds of crops, um, corn, uh, soybeans, uh, cotton, uh, and, and in, in wheat and a lot of the crops that we grow here in the state uh, is because there's a lot of this uh, very valuable research going on and the impact is going to be uh, dramatic in terms of farmers access uh, to the best seeds, uh, the best varieties uh, so that we can uh, you know, grow as, as much as we can, be as, as profitable as possible, but also do it in a way that uh, reduces our impact on the environment and and you know maximizes our uh, our resource efficiency. So uh, it's a great point, and it's really it is going to affect farmers' access to seeds and, and the best uh, varieties. Thanks again. If you have a question, just press zero on your phone uh, to ask your question. The next question comes from uh, comes from uh, Bury uh, in Forest Grove. Bury, are you there? Sorry, Burl, are you there? Yes. Earl, go ahead and ask your question. Um, it sounds to me like they're trying to create another bureaucracy that the taxpayers are going to have to pay for. <laughs> you know, Earl, you're right. The only thing that you're not quite right is it's not just one bureaucracy, it's two. Because Measure 92 creates two state bureaucracies or allows two state bureaucracies that are going to be responsible for overseeing and inspecting and testing and monitoring everything from thousands of farms to tens of thousands of products in thousands of stores across the state, all for the words on a label. And I should point out, too, there is no uh, funding source that is provided under Measure 92, so it will have to come out of the existing state coffers. And there is no limit of taxpayer money that can be spent on this. And, of course, this is going to be expensive. You think about everything, every part of the food chain from the farm to the grocery store, and that all has to be tested and inspected and monitored for compliance taxpayers pay for it all. It's one of the many reasons I think that Measure 92 deserves a no vote. And our next question comes from John in Salem. John, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, I'd like to know what are the advantages that we can expect from 92 if it should pass. I don't believe there are any. Here's what I think you can expect, John. I think you can expect higher prices at the grocery store, I think you can expect uh, higher taxes on tax day because uh, taxpayers have got to fund this. And I can guarantee you that there are going to be inaccurate and misleading labels on your food. There's going to be some food labels that say there's GE in it, but there's not. For example, anything with sugar or cornstarch or corn oil, something such as that. No GE in the processed product, even if it came from a GE plant, but yet it, you'd have a label on your product saying that it does contain GE. You're going to get inaccurate labels, increase the cost of your groceries, 
increased cost to taxpayers, and the people like Kevin and uh, family farmers around Oregon are going to have increased costs and burdens that no other farmers in the country have to comply with. Thanks so much, Dana. Again, if you want to ask us a question, all you have to do is push zero on your phone. If you want to learn more or you want to sign up to join the coalition and vote no on 92, you can go to factsabout92.com to their website and sign up right there. Our next question comes from uh, JJ in Portland. JJ, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, we we see things in the mail and we've seen things on TV about vote no for Measure 92, and I have never seen it written out. What does it ac actually say so I understand why I'm voting no, voting no or yes? Well, JJ, you can find a copy of, of Measure 92 on the Secretary of State's uh, website, uh, but I'll give you just the brief summary. It's, it's about a labeling system that would exist only in the state of Oregon, and the proponents will tell you it's about labeling all foods with GMO ingredients in them, but in fact it's not because they exempted two-thirds of the food that's even sold in the state. Um, and they didn't uh, specify how the state taxpayers were going to fund this and fund all the compliance measures. Um, and they also didn't talk about all the regulatory burdens that fall to people like Kevin and other family farmers uh, in the state. So the Secretary of State's website has the, the initiative. Um, I think you'll find uh, that it is filled with exemptions that are indefensible, and the cost will follow after this. Again, if you want to ask a question, all you have to do is push zero. You can also find more information at factsabout92.com. Our next question comes from Cezanne. Cezanne, go ahead. Hello? Hi. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that I um, I just feel this is just another example of how we have too much government in our lives and just seems like they constantly, you know, just come up with regulations just to make us crazy. But um, my question my question is, uh, what are they trying to protect us from? What is this GMO ingredient supposed to do to us if they're so worried about it being labeled? You know, Suzanne, these are the foods that we've been eating for over 20 years. I mean, there have literally been billions of people who have eaten trillions of meals of GE foods. There has never in that entire history been one ill effect that's been documented. We've been feeding these to our families across the world for 20 years. So there is no, there is no scientific justification. In fact, every major medical and scientific organization literally in the world, largely, opposes labeling of GMO foods. At the same time, though, I have to say I recognize that there are consumers who may prefer foods without GMO ingredients in them. For those consumers, there are already two nationwide labels. They can look for either the organic or the non-GMO label. Both of those are reliable. Both of those are consistent, unlike Measure 92. And they won't increase the cost of groceries for all Oregon families. It's one of the reasons that Measure 92 deserves a no vote. We already have labeling systems in place. Again, if you want to ask a question, all you have to do is push zero on the phone, but we want to hear from you, and this is, we're going to ask a question we already asked. What actions are you willing to take to protect Oregon farmers? Push one, if you'll encourage friends and family to vote no. Push two, to write a letter to the editor about voting no. Push three, if you'll share information on Facebook and Twitter about voting no. Push four, if you'll do all of the above. Again, one, to encourage friends and family to vote no. Two, to write a letter three to share literature on Facebook or Twitter, and then four for all of the above. Uh, our next question is going to come from Shelly in Eugene. Shelly, go ahead. Shelly, are you there? No, looks like we lost Shelly. Um, but we're going to go to Gail next. Uh, Gail, go ahead and ask your question. Hello? Hi, Gail. Go ahead. Hey, hello. Hey, this sounds to me, uh, this whole debunkle, since we've already voted it down as well as uh, several other states. I'm from Portland, Oregon. And um, it sounds very political to me in that this is a bureaucracy thing going on. And I just want a straight answer about that. Is that who the proponents of this measure? Is that what this is all about? Is bigger taxes more money from the people, um, it, it, it just seems to point to that for, to me. 
You're right on it, Gail. That's exactly what where we're headed with Measure 92. And you mentioned something. Yeah, this is the same out-of-state group who brought this to Oregon a few years back. Oregon voters rejected it then, so the same group. They took it to California. They rejected it. Washington rejected it. And it's like deja vu all over again. We're right back here in Oregon with the same flawed measure. And you, and you alluded to it, you know, when you talked about this is something that increases government bureaucracies because there's two bureaucracies that have got to write all the rules and enforce this and inspect farms like Kevin and other family farmers and then every food product and every grocery store to make sure that the words on a label are where they should be and how they should be written. That's where it gets completely costly and there's no funding mechanism for taxpayers. It simply makes no sense. It deserves a no vote. Yeah, thank you, Dana. That's very, very well put. Again, if you have a question you want to ask, push zero. Um, and to learn more, go to factsabout92.com. Um, Kevin, I think you wanted to say something here. Yeah, no, I, I, Chris, I just wanted to thank so thank you so much for hosting uh, this uh, town hall. I think a lot of the the callers really highlighted just how unnecessary uh, Measure 92 is on one hand, and then uh, those who have knowledge of agriculture know uh, what a burden. It, we already have to deal with uh, regulatory oversight and different requirements on the farm. And this is just one more costly and unnecessary uh, requirement uh, that doesn't help consumers and is going to make it much more difficult and much more costly for uh, family farmers on, in Oregon to, to remain uh, productive and, and do what we do best to provide consumers with uh, the highest quality food. Uh, and, and so that's why I really am pleased that we had so many people call in, and I urge everyone to vote no on 92. Hey, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight and spending, you know, 45 minutes with us uh, to learn more about the flaws and uh, failings of Measure 92. You know, as we, we discussed a lot of important issues uh, surrounding this measure tonight and, and talking about how it fails on its fundamental promise to provide information because it's so poorly written and there's so many special exemptions and loopholes. And at the same time, we already have two national labeling systems that don't have those special exemptions and loopholes, and they provide accurate information and they don't increase the cost of groceries, like Measure 92 will do, increasing the cost by hundreds of dollars a year for all Oregon families. So I appreciate that all of you took you know, 45 minutes to spend some time with us this evening and have a discussion, and we just urge you to go to the website of factsabout92.com. Please ask any questions you have or join our coalition, uh, and most importantly, please vote no on Measure 92. It deserves a no vote. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. If we were unable to get to your question, please go to factsabout92.com, and you can enter your question there, or we're going to put you into a voicemail right now so you can leave a closing comment. Hope you all have a great evening, and thanks again for your time.